The beginning of a new era in Japan. We will take a closer look at Emperor Naruhito. What does the change mean for the country and its neighbors? Hello, I'm Arun Naidu and this is The Heat. Japan is now in the era of Reiwa, which means beautiful harmony. Emperor Naruhito takes over the throne on Wednesday after his father, Akihito, abdicated due to his age and failing health. Since World War II, the position has lost power, but the emperor is still a revered figure in the country, which names the reigns of its emperors as eras, a millennial tradition that has its roots in China. Although Japan uses the Gregorian calendar, the era appears on coins, official paperwork, and even on driver's licenses. For the first time, the name was not taken from Chinese literature, but from a Japanese poem. That, along with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's desire for stronger defense forces, raised concerns that the country would take a more nationalistic turn. To discuss all of that, we welcome to our studio Yoshikazu Kato. He is an adjunct associate professor at the University of Hong Kong. Also with us, Saurabh Gupta is a resident senior fellow at the Institute for China-America Studies. From Dallas, Hiroki Takeuchi is an associate professor of political science at Southern Methodist University. And Shindo Shu is a senior fellow at the Pangol Institution. He's in Beijing. And welcome to all of you. Yoshi, let's start here in the yeah. studio. A new imperial era begins in Japan. It's a very important day in Japan today, isn't it? Yeah, it's very important. And actually, I was born in Showa and experienced the whole entire Heisei era, and now Japan is entering the Reiwa. So, you know, it, it means a Japanese, you know, transition after so-called, you know, lost two or three decades. So now our prime minister emphasized, you know, we have to move forward, and, you know, everybody are celebrating, you know, this new year is coming. So I think uh, it's a very important year, and now Japan is trying to move forward. Uh, in a new term. So I think it means a lot for every Japanese citizen. So it translates into beautiful harmony, the Reiwa era. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the significance of that, Yoshi? Uh, first of all, you know, uh, you know, Japan should be, you know, integrated and moving forward with a certain order. But, you know, what means harmony? You know, maybe some, some tradition, you know, from China. Uh, but, you know, we need to, you know, uh, harmonize our society and integrate our Japanese citizen and moving forward. But maybe some emphasis on our new, our tradition, because Shinzo Abe, you know, emphasized, you know, we need to make a point of our nature, our tradition, and our history. But now, you know, the, the world is more globalized, you know, so, you know, how to, you know, combine and harmonize the Japan's, you know, national interest and the global issues. So I think, it, anyway, it means something new. Yeah. All right, let me go to Hiroki. He is in Dallas. And Hiroki, yes. Japan has used the imperial era system since the 7th century, and it's been used for over mm -hmm. a thousand years. Um, how big a turning point is this for Japan? Well, this turning point is uh, unique in the sense that, uh, you know, usually uh, the turning point of era occurs when emperor passed away. So uh, people cannot celebrate the, uh, the turning point. But this time, uh, emperor who is still alive uh, stepped down and then new emperor comes in. So uh, people are really like uh, in a celebration mode. And uh, so, so in that sense, this is a very uh, important turning point. But having said that, um, the emperor it does not have any political authority. So in that sense, uh, there is much more continuation than the change. So the, emperor, uh, the emperor's role still remains largely ceremonial. Uh, yes, um, it's uh, called uh, constitutionally emperor is a symbol of the state, and uh, that uh, is uh, emphasized by uh, originally the Showa emperor uh, in 1945, and then like, uh, later uh, the uh, former emperor who, that, who has just stepped down, and then a like, the new emperor too. Shindo Shu, uh, of course, China would be looking at all of this very closely. These are neighbors. Uh, these are trading partners as well. This is what the Chinese Foreign Ministry said about the new Japanese era. Let's watch this. 
Emperor Akihito visited China in 1992 and met with Chinese party and state leaders on many occasions, making positive contributions to the development of Sino-Japanese relations. At present, Sino-Japanese relations are back on track, showing a positive momentum of development. We hope that Japan, together with China, will cherish and maintain the positive momentum of bilateral relations. So, Shindo, how would you characterize the relationship between Japan and China right now? Well, I think as uh, the spokesperson has said, it is back on track since last year, the 40th anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. Uh, so that's a, a good opportunity for, the, for both sides to restore their relationship. And then I think the momentum is being kept on. Uh, obviously, the Japan has uh, been working with China closely and the framework of Belt and Road Initiative. And in terms of trade, the two countries are closely intertwined. China is the largest trading partner of Japan. And I think in general, uh, as long as the two sides can handle the issue, for example, territorial disputes, and on the Japanese side, the history issue, uh, 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 well handled, and then the relationship will be stable and peaceful. I think, you know, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping is uh, uh, coming to Japan uh, next month. So hopefully that will be another step to strengthen the bilateral ties. So, uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was elected on a nationalist platform. He introduced laws to expand the role of the defense forces in China. He also wants changes to the current constitution, uh, which actually right now forbids the creation of an offensive uh, defense force. Uh, is the country undergoing something of a rethink on its place in the world right now? The country has been undergoing a rethink of its place in the world, I would say, right since the beginning of the, of the Heisei era, the era when, Aki, when Akihito became the emperor. Yeah. Japan became rich. Japan wanted to get integrated to, into the world, both from a defense perspective, it wanted to take a role, uh, 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 and a limited role, and make international contributions. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and Japan has liberalized its economy significantly after that, particularly after the bursting of the bubble. The situation in East Asia has become fairly tense from Japan's perspective over the last 10, 15 years, given the tremendous rise of China, which has which has created certain anxieties in the region. Mr. Abe himself came in with strong nationalist views. Some even call, used to call him revisionist, but he has been a lot more pragmatic in office. So I would say this is a continuation of from the Heisei era, but there has been a certain degree of realism of the circumstances that Japan faces, and we see that in terms of Japan's approach to its neighbors and in terms of beginning to get greater defense capabilities so that it can take care of its own deterrent abilities at a time when the U.S. is a little bit wishy-washy at times about its role in the Asia-Pacific. Yoshi, uh, Prime Minister Abe, he spoke at the imperial ceremony in Japan. Uh, this is part of what he had to say. Let's watch this. We are determined to create a bright future for a proud Japan filled with peace and hope at a time when the international situation is changing dramatically. So when it comes to military policy, when it comes to foreign policy, are we going to see a more assertive Japanese policy? Oh, oh and I, I'm not sure whether, you know, we, we can use assertive, you know, yeah. this word or not, but I, I, but I think, you know, at least uh, Shinzo Abe is trying to exercise more leadership in the regional issue, like TPP-11 or RCEP. Now that you're know, looking at the United States, you know, Trump is you know, playing relatively in more looking you know, policy in Asia Pacific. So I think now it's a kind of a chance for Shinzo Abe uh, to exercise more leadership. And I think it's very important point is, is succession at this time is you know, happening under the Shinzo Abe's administration. So I think maybe Shinzo Abe is trying to you know, emphasize you know, what kind of roles Japan can exercise in this region, uh, both economical and foreign policy. Yoshi, uh, the United States has been espousing an America first policy. It's, mm -hmm. been, uh, it's changed in the way that it's looking at its foreign policy. It's more inward looking, according to yeah. President Trump. Does that concern Japan? Of course. Mm -hmm. And you know, the biggest impact is that the United States is withdrawn from the TPP. Yeah. And now Japan is trying to lead the TPP 11. And of course, you know, we hope the United States could make a more commitment in the Asia Pacific, but now uh, it's unlikely. So maybe to some extent, it's a chance for Japan. 
to you know, you know, implement the more, you said, assertive or you know, positive policy or proactive or comprehensive policy in Asia Pacific to lead the regional integration on both in economy and foreign policy. I think this is a good chance. Hiroki, how are these different yes. eras seen in Japan? There was a recent poll in Japan done by the Kyoto mm -hmm. News Agency which showed that 74% of Japanese approve of the name of the new era. And in fact, mm -hmm. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's own personal approval ratings went up by 10%. It went up to 53%. Uh, some have interpreted this as a new patriotism, a new conservatism in Japan. Would you agree with that? Uh, I disagree with that, that there is any like, new patriotism or um, any uh, nationalism in Japan now. Uh, it's not uh, the rise in like, uh, patriotism or nationalism. And one example is and actually uh, what are people doing right now other than celebrating the emperor, uh, new emperor? Well, uh, most of the people are enjoying the t uh, 10 consecutive day holidays. So uh, is it like you know, showing the patriotism or nationalism? Well, I'm not sure. So uh, I think that, that it's, uh, well, if you are asked uh, whether uh, you like the name Reiwa or not, you know, most people would say yes. And then uh, the new era, uh, new emperor, uh, will, uh, is bringing the kind of optimism and uh, very happy um, uh, feeling. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, it doesn't change any like, a reality. So, uh, you know, Japan like, uh, will... Um, be uh, will be uh, will keep like committed uh, to the reforms and uh, uh, also uh, new uh, uh, so their um, uh, new era uh, will be uh, it's uh, about the same uh, continuation uh, from the old era. Right, Hiroki, uh, that new name that uh, you know we talk about, beautiful harmony, Reiwa. Uh, what was the thinking mm -hmm. behind the choice of that name? You actually know some of the people who are involved in choosing that name, didn't? Uh, weren't you? Uh, yes, so uh, this time uh, Abe administration was very careful about the uh, uh, succession process because the constitution that didn't say anything about the rule of uh, cons uh, succession if emperor steps down while he is still alive. So uh, institutionalization of succession is very important. So uh, Abe administration made a committee and then committee uh, uh, insti uh, decided the institution and then basically Abe uh, administration passed the bill and then uh, legislated it. So uh, they were very careful and then I think that is, this is a big event but uh, it, was, uh, it has uh, occurred uh, without any uh, big problem. Uh, so th which means you know, Abe administration was very uh, well prepared uh, in that sense. Um, so uh, the choice of the name, I think, like, uh, I'm not saying anything, um, I don't have any view about, you know, which name is better than what. Uh, but I think, you know, that's actually, they uh, choose the appropriate name. Uh, and then, so that's actually one of the reasons, uh, one of the uh, reasons why um, there is no um, uh, strong opposition or problem um, that happened before, uh, because of the name. Right. Shindoshu, in the last century, uh, just before World War II, Japan invaded China. Uh, we had the massacre at Nanjing. Uh, thousands of women were raped. Um, and does that invasion and the horrific treatment that the Chinese uh, were subjected to by the Japanese, do, to what extent does that still frame China's view of Japan? Well, in general, uh, if there's, um, you know, um, not at a sensitive uh, date, let's say, or if there's no controversial, for example, the visit to the Yasu Kuni Shuan, where you have these uh, Class A uh, criminals uh, by, say, senior uh, Japanese officials or by the prime minister himself. Uh, otherwise, I would say that's rather peaceful between the two countries. For the Chinese people, Japan represents an advanced economy, you know, advanced technology. Uh, people love to buy Japanese-made products and uh, love to visit this country. Uh, very peaceful, very stable, uh, so very safe. Uh, so in general, I would say that's a very positive uh, impression about Japan, you know, <laughs> unless there is a disruption of a historical issue, sometimes territorial disputes over there. As long as these two issues are well handled on the two uh, by the two sides, I would say uh, the relationship is uh, uh, in general very strong. You know, on, or economically for China, you know, Japan is both an example and also a lesson, uh, you know, like a lost to a 
uh, two decades or three decades on the Japanese side. For the Chinese side, they are trying to study and trying to do something different in case falling the same trap, etc. So, uh, in, and, you know, you look at like RCEP, our colleague mentioned about that. I think both China and Japan are working hard to uh, complete that uh, negotiation as soon as possible. So to push forward this multilateral uh, trade approach, uh, both sides cherish that. Sure, there are geopolitical shifts in that part of the world. Uh, strategic balance is changing as well. Uh, China has increased its presence in the South China Sea, and that's uh, put it at odds with the United States. It's led to frictions between these two countries. But it's also drawn Japan into the region. Last September, Japan deployed a submarine in the South China Sea for the first time since World War II. Um, and that was for joint exercises with the United States. How would Beijing see something like that? Uh, Beijing has not been happy to see external parties, when, when it says external parties, it means non-claimants and non-littoral states and non-ASEAN states related to the South China Sea getting involved with regard to the South China Sea. And Japan has been at the forefront in terms of trying to bring international players into the South China Sea, and that has caused some degree of of anger in Beijing. We now have the Australians, the French, the, the, the Great Britain, and of course the US sailing through frequently out there. US frequently, the others less frequently. And Japan has been encouraging that. So that has been a point of friction. But, I, but that is something which needs to be managed and dealt with. And I would say that fundamentally, Japan-China relations will be shaped not so much by the South China Sea, but by developments in the East China Sea. Mm -hmm. And there are potentially a huge fric bunch of friction areas with regard to the sea. You know, let me, if I could just jump yeah. back once on that Reva name which you had asked yeah. and get to the bottom of that. You know, the purpose of the Reva name Shinzo Abe took leadership on this front. Right. He has always had certain, let's just say, issues with China, and he was and has wanted to have a more independent-minded stance from China. That's one. He saw that that that, that this was plucked out of indigenous Japanese poetry, not from Chinese literature. Mm -hmm. But for him, the important decisive point was that. That, that, that those, those words which were quoted were the word, our words, uh, poetry, poem, is, is, reflects not just high senior establishment officials talking about Japan, but also includes our words from common folks in Japan, farmers, shopkeepers, traders. And he thought that that name gave a symbol and emphasis of Japan as being a nation, not just of its leaders, but of its people. And he has always had this idea of Japan as this timeless, beautiful country. He had right. this concept of Utsukushikuni, beautiful nation. Mm -hmm. And so he's brought that concept of unity and harmony and beauty together in one word. And that's why we have that, the, the name Rewa, the way it has been framed out. Yeah, beautiful harmony. Yoshi, uh, let's get back to the relationship between the United States and Japan. Uh, President Trump will be visiting. In fact, he'll be the first foreign leader to visit mm -hmm. in this new era. Mm -hmm. uh, he appears to have a good relationship with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. But for the Japanese, what will be their priorities? What will they want to get out of this meeting? I mean, uh, one priority is trade. Yeah. Now, Japan, China, Japan, the United States, we are you know, negotiating on trade uh, agreement on goods. And I think it, it, uh, what is expected would be, you know, if uh, Mr. Trump visits Japan uh, in this month, uh, if something agreement could be, you know, signed or, and disclosed, I think this is going to be a very good uh, driving force for G20 summit uh, held in next month. And this, this is going to be a very good political asset for the, the other administration. But the problem is, you know, how to... Uh, you know, maybe more broadly speaking, TPP, or in a more in a broad and regional cooperation, because now President Trump is very sticky to the bilateral, you know, right. negotiation. But you know, now Japan is uh, playing, trying to play more multilateral, you know, more in a macro and long-term vision in this region. So how to take balance between the bilateral negotiation with the United States and the regional integration, and including TPP 11 and RCEP, because now. The United States is absent in this regard, so you know it, it's a great you know challenge for the Prime Minister Abe. But you know we are ho we are trying to host G20 summit in Osaka, right. so you know it means a lot you know in, in the regard of the new era. So it's very interesting time.
Hiroki, how do you see it? I mean, uh, Japan is at the point right now where its economy is stagnant, its population is aging, um, population is also declining in numbers, and you don't, I mean, when you read about the economy in Japan, you, you hear about young people who don't seem to be very interested in buying homes or buying new cars. Uh, Abe has introduced some reforms, but where do you see it going? Well, uh, first of all, um, it's true that uh, uh, young people do not uh, are not interested in so much on um, buying houses or buying uh, cars, mm -hmm. but uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they cannot buy them. Uh, they are, their uh, their preferences are very uh, different uh, from our generation. I cannot, you know, imagine that you know young people cannot are not interested in owning a car, uh, you know, from uh, my generation's perspective. But uh, at the same time, you know, young people are enjoy, uh, giving a priority to uh, uh, spending, uh, uh, enjoying the time with the family or like, uh, you know, the eating, dining in a nice restaurant. So, uh, so in that sense, uh, not, uh, the lack of interest in uh, buying houses or cars is not a good indication of, you know, the ja uh, Japanese economy is uh, stagnating. Um, having said that, uh, it's true that you know, uh, reforms are needed. And the uh, Abe administration has implemented quite a few reforms, especially in the field of agriculture and labor. But uh, that is not sufficient, and then uh, more reforms are needed. So perhaps the current like, optimistic uh, mood may give some momentum for further reform uh, for, that is uh, necessary for uh, revival or further growth of the Japanese economy. Right, Hiroki, I have one other thing I want to talk to you about. And, um I just want to play you this tape uh, of some of the views, some of the opinions of Japanese people that we spoke to, and this is, uh, this is what they had to say. Let's watch this. The emperor would visit the sites affected by natural disasters and would talk to the victims face to face. It is true the emperor is seen to be like a god, but at the same time, you felt that you were close to him. I think we should never go to war again, and in that respect, the current emperor symbolized peace. And so I'm a little sad that he is abdicating, but I believe the next emperor will carry on his legacy. So, Hiroki, do you think that the new emperor will maintain this anti-war sentiment? Uh, I think so, uh, but at the same time, you know, we should keep in mind that the emperor has no political authority. Right. So uh, it's like really like uh, depends on uh, the administration, and uh, I don't see uh, any like a tendency for uh, for war uh, in the uh, Abe administration. Uh, although they passed the uh, uh, security legislation a few years ago, but that is actually inst just institutionalized what has already happened uh, for Japanese security policy. So I think it's like a implementing the security policy, it's better to uh, implement the security policy by in, uh, institutionalization rather than like ad hoc uh, uh, policy making. So in that sense, um, the Abe administration has the security policy has been also, also the continu uh, continuation of the previous administrations. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, it seems that the security policy has uh, been changing. Uh, but not because the security principle, principle of the policy is changed, but because the external environment has been changing, especially the Chinese power has been rising. And then also we should not forget that the U.S. commitment to, the, to Japan and East Asia has been uh, declining. So that's actually another uh, reality uh, or that uh, forms the external environment. And then basically Japanese security policy has been uh, responding to the new reality of external environment. Shindashu, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has been, uh, last week he was in the United States, he had a meeting with President Trump at the White House. After that meeting, this is what President Trump said. Let's watch this. I like the Prime Minister, he's a friend of mine, but I said, Mr. Prime Minister, we gotta do something. For so many decades, we've been losing tens of billions of dollars to China and Japan and India, and name any country. He started by saying that he's putting $40 billion into the United States for new car factories. Toyota's coming in with $14 billion. Many, many companies are coming in. So, Shindo, according to Trump, that Japan will invest more in United States companies. Will that have an impact on relations, trade relations, between China and the United States? 
Uh, well, I, I think that's the uh, Japanese approach, obviously, to deal with Trump. Uh, you know, uh, he needs numbers, he needs uh, victory, he needs, uh, you know, like his, uh, the image he's fighting for the U.S. interests, like everybody is owing him something. And so I think Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is working hard, uh, you know, to represent Japan, to protect the Japanese uh, interests uh, in dealing with uh, uh, Donald Trump over there. Uh, you know, like China and Japan in a similar situation uh, to deal with the U.S., to deal with uh, an administration which is more aggressive, more assertive in terms of a trade, and also, um, you know, his personal view, like as long as there's a, um, a trade deficit that's, you know, uh, the U.S. is being taken advantage of by other countries like Japan, like China. In that sense, Jap uh, Japan and China are in a similar situation that, you know, uh, both countries have a trade surplus. Uh, uh, with the United States, so right. there, there's um, obviously there's an issue in the eyes of, uh, of Trump over there. Yoshi, uh, Prime Minister Abe said uh, one of his big challenges is getting more women involved in the Japanese economy, getting more women in the workforce in Japan. Um, how big a challenge is that for him? Because now Japan is the most serious aging society, yeah. so you know how to take advantage of the power of women. Uh, younger generation, even you know foreign you know labors, you know it's going to be an issue. So women, you know, because you know we know uh, women's power have been neglected or ignored, uh, not only by nature but some institutional problems. So now Shinzo Abe is trying to stimulate, you know, some potentiality in the cabinet, in in the company. So it, it, it's it needs you know very you know social and political powers to stimulate this atmosphere. So I think this is a good thing, and this is exactly happening, but it takes time. And you know, how to institutionalize you know, this you know, mechanism rather than just you know, you know, speaking up some slogan, you, know, you should you know, take part in some activities. You know, it takes time. Yeah. You know, so it's not only on women, but you know, younger generation or foreign labor. So it, it, it takes time, exactly. Yeah. So Rob, the new emperor, Emperor Naruhito, he spent two years at Oxford University in England. Um, do you think that will give him more of a Western outlook? He is a very modern man. There's no question about that. He was, in, in the early 2000s, he took it upon himself to question the imperial household agency's disciplinary strictures on his wife, who is a very, very educated lady in her own accord and was in the Japanese foreign ministry at one point of time. So I have no hesitations in saying that Naruhito will be a, a very modern, good emperor, a liberal-leaning emperor, who at least he will be able to direct and be that symbol of Japan, which shows Japan to be a tolerant, liberal, and forward-looking country. It will depend, though, to a great extent on uh, Japanese politicians, Japan has not been able to effect a two-party system, and we have had the predominance of conservative politicians in Japan, and that could take Japan in a different direction. But on Naruhito, I think he'd be a great, great emperor. Okay, and that's where we're going to have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. Beth, the conversation continues online. Join us on CGT in America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show. Or chat with us on Twitter at CGT in America. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.